Good man. Jason Tucker, uh, we're streaming live on OCWP.org, and um, I'm a web developer. Jason Tucker. Yeah, I'm Joe Snyder, and this is uh, Jessica Wynn, my business partner. Uh, we have a 501c3 nonprofit organization, torch1975.org, uh, and we need a lot of help with our website. Uh, we're definitely not techie, so we're in the wrong place, hopefully at the right time, though. Um, <laughs> Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, Torch1975.org. That's our website. No, 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 no. Oh, I'm a Marine, so you'll have to forgive me for any of your Anyway, that's us. So we need help on our website. We got a big event planned at Camp Pendleton this summer. It's uh, national, worldwide, in scope. We've got to get our website up to speed, and uh, you know we, we're looking for somebody to want to work with us and get a lot of publicity for your own business. And uh, I got a picture of President Ford carrying off a baby off of a Operation Baby Lift aircraft in April 1975, and this baby grew up became a Marine, so they'll be there at our big event this summer. So, anyway, that's just a short brief of who we are and what we are. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Lucy, and I teach people how to uh, make sites with WordPress and do a little bit of development. I think it's a five book. Okay, I'm a web developer. I'm a little bit of 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 a Uh, I'm Preston, I'm uh, and I run WordPress websites and Microsoft Microsoft. I'm Jared, and I'm also known as the coach as WordPress lover. We do the back end and we're taking my So, what's up, most of you for I don't need to do the right thing. I'm going to do the right thing. 
either understanding it better or finding some way to help them. Cool. So, I'm going to show us how a product guy. Uh, Drive out, you think I get in? Oh shit! Oh, what was it? It was there was another one that yeah there was another one that Say was trying to set up. Watch the water. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. Say is trying to. No, they had a Christmas thing, but that, that was it.
going to do uh, here at the meetup uh, is Can you help someone? Are you on uh, yes. the same network as me? Um, try Zeek Private without the extended. Yeah. Okay, cool.
once I'm done with that, uh, I can then report a book to me if I want to. I used to do that in a long time to actually make sure we do that to uh, YouTube. We don't do that anymore. Um, the way I go about it now is everything happens off YouTube right So if we go to YouTube, Uh, what happens here is I can actually see our uh, our live our live video feed will start. Uh, so What ends up happening is I begin streaming from uh, from my computer and shoot out to YouTube. Um, if you've ever seen our show, the watercolor that we do, uh, what that's using is a, a, a thing that YouTube provides and Google Plus provides all What I do is I, I take my Google, if I do my video, but I push it from Google Plus to that then sends all of that video over to YouTube. So as you're watching the video, you're actually seeing it off my YouTube account instead of having to uh, you know, connect directly to my laptop or you have a lot of data to put out the video. So the video is actually being sent directly to YouTube and YouTube's you know, passing out the server to so the video. Now what ends up happening on, on our site here What ends up happening on our side here is when someone goes on to the OCD or <laughs> but what ends up happening is you'll see um, our video feed go up there. You can see in the corner here, here we go, we're going to go, go, go bigger to home. <laughs> Over the corner there's me. Um, the screen that's right here is actually the screen that was uh, pushed out. But that is being served by YouTube, right? Yeah, so this is actually on, on, is on YouTube, so uh, we get the full YouTube interface here. So if you go on and look on the YouTube video feed, yeah, it should show up. Yeah, it should automatically slide up onto YouTube and then you can watch that video later. Uh, so that's how that works. Is you get if you go on YouTube, you grab the, the YouTube uh, address, you get that into WordPress, and you can do all the work you want. Um, I don't know if you can if any of you have used you know uh, embed codes or anything like that, but it's really simple just to grab the code off of off of YouTube and then be able to uh, put it onto your onto your WordPress site and you can select it. One of the other things we do with uh, or, sorry, the wireboard and the CWT is we go and set up these uh, blog posts, which essentially is 
Um, you can see, like, everything that C is going to be, you know, that I wanted to represent to us today, put all of that information on there. We also set up some Google Docs. And um, it's kind of gone through and set up a little extra little computer. Um, it's a little bit more easier to plug into the Google Docs. The access site. What this is, this is a live stream. So you have the video feed over on the side here. And then over on the right hand side, you have the uh, chat box to be able to you know, watch the video and chat with everyone. Uh, outside that, that's it. Did you see the wizard for that? I'm sorry? They're being rude outside. Um, I said, is that just a widget that you Yeah, that's, the IRC chat is just a widget that um, you get off of. And so this, this YouTube streaming service, is that built into YouTube or you need some sort of special account for it? You just need to have a Google Plus account. That's okay. It. So you have a Google account, then you have a Google Plus account. And then you do a right hand side of the Google button that says, you know, I want to do a hangout. Click hangout. Um, I would set one up right now, but I can't. <laughs> My computer will actually blow up. And Jason, isn't the hangout only have a 30 minute minimum? Or is that not true? The hangout has a three hour. Um, you can, you can do, uh, <laughs> Oh, you don't want them. <laughs> but what, what you end up doing is you can see, like, right here, you can see that, you'll see that, uh, the Google Hangout will show up, and then who, who's all involved in that Hangout. Um, I'm actually having a Hangout by myself. Like like that other hangout you had. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can you can set up a little hangout that just has you. Um, there's a little there's a little box that shows up that says, you know, I want to start a hangout so we'll talk about this. I think it's something with the, uh, with the BGA Oh, uh, yeah, probably. But once it, once it connects, what, what ends up happening is you get, uh, you get this interface here. And uh, up on top here is where you can specify who you want to invite. Um, you can add a social for the CNET. I don't invite anyone. I name it whatever I want to show up on YouTube. And then after that, there's a little box at the bottom there that says enable keynotes on air. That says take whatever I record here and put it directly on you. Nice. So what you can do is you can have a, you know, like your war meetings or something like that. Or some, you know, some event that's public uh, leaving meetings or something. And take that, take that video stream and push it out there so that someone can watch it. And then also be able to have an archive. That's what I do here, that's what I do here for this, and this is what I also do for the uh, uh, water um, Everybody gets on the video screen, they all watch it, and then when we're done, it's archived and ready to be ready to go on here. Any questions regarding like, the technologies used here or things like that? Well, if you have any questions or anything, uh, feel free to. Uh, I want to know, what's IRC? <laughs> okay. Who knows? Who doesn't know what IRC is? Raise their hand. Yeah. We got one. That's okay. You're not missing much. Don't worry about it. Okay. Good. You don't know what IRC is? You can teach about four minutes if you want. What's that? You're welcome. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. All right, last chance. Can you share the screen?
Bucks. 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 All of them. It's called picture and picture. So we got everything. So, let's see. Barbecue chicken. What's that? Hawaiian. <laughs> 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 this one? That's like three bucks. I Hawaiian. But see, it just shows me. Pineapple. And this is just local on my computer. That's not the baby bacon. It's just on my computer. I know. Uh, <laughs> Google Plus, would, like, you'd show your screen and the water at the same time. You'd be showing your screen and you'd be showing this little box on that screen. It takes a care of the There's no, nothing extra you have to do. I'm going to ask you what that is. No problem. My son wants to videotape his own crap stuff. That would work perfect. Yeah, it will rainbow. <laughs> All the way, dude. <laughs> Jason, Jason, is there uh, any marketing? Opportunities with that live stream thing. A lot. Yeah. Oh yeah. Look on um, Bloomberg is using it. Um, Huffington Post is using it. Um, all the big guys are using it, and it costs them nothing. Really. Yes. Mm -hmm. Live streaming. Yeah. You're live streaming with multiple people. If you go to the website, if you go to the website, the Anybody else? Before I order. All right. Lights? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Elizabeth on how to do the exercises. So, well, we can do some code and post it. Who all is familiar with Genesis and hopes to have it? Anybody who doesn't understand that concept? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, basically, uh, some of these frameworks, Genesis and is what I'm showing. Uh, they have a bunch of what are called hooks. So various points of the framework is creating the content of your page, they'll throw out an event or a hook that allows you to kind of tap in and do something like that. And so that's, that's the beauty of Genesis. They have all these hooks all over the place. I need a pizza list. <laughs> 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 it's very important. Yes, it is. So they have all these hooks that allow you to just take control over just one little portion of the screen and output some content or do whatever you want. So I have here a quick demo on how to do this. All right, thank you. So first off, Elizabeth's question was about using the visual hook problem, which is found here. I'll link. If you want to go to this page here, this is my blog. Um, you can look at this code and, and use it or not at your but the visual hook guide is a plugin that hooks in everywhere that Genesis throws a hook and presents a little box to show you visually on the page where that hook is being fired while the page is being constructed. So, as you can see, there's a whole bunch of these. All these large boxes are these hooks that you can use. So, you can do all sorts of things in here. For this demo, I'm just going to create a hook right here before the content. So one of the easiest ways to get some content onto the page is by using a sidebar. So my demo just creates a sidebar, hooks in, and outputs that contents of that sidebar onto the page. And here's the code that does it. So the first part, right here, we need to register the sidebar. So when WordPress itself, not Genesis, this is just WordPress, 
the WordPress throws the widgets in it patch, and that's where you want to hook in and register your sidebar. So we do that here. That's all it is to create the sidebar. You can add this to your functions PHP or in a plugin. I just do this in the plugin. So it has nothing to do with the PHP. Now, the next part is you chose your hook from your other page here for the visual hook guide. Find the hook that you want to use. And you add an action with that hook. Here I'm using the Genesis before content. That's the name of this hook right here Genesis before content. So this function here, output custom sidebar, is going to be called when that hook is being thrown by Genesis. All I do in here is I check to see if you're on the home page because I want to limit the sidebar to appear only on the home page. Make sure that there's something in the sidebar. And then I tell the sidebar to output itself. That's all it is. Real simple. So the end result, you can find on this page here. This is just a test site that I use. And this is the sidebar that was created and a text widget that I put in that sidebar. That's all I did. So this little tiny piece of code here, create the sidebar, hook in, tell the sidebar to output itself. This is what it does. So you can just go crazy with all of these hooks doing all sorts of things. Hook in before the top of the page, at the bottom, put a new menu in your footer, a custom menu, anything you like. Just use the right hook and do whatever you need to do to output that content for, for the context of what you're doing. Does that make sense? Any questions? Anybody? Yes? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry. Did you get If your slider is, is presented as a widget, you just drop that widget into your sidebar. And this code will... When you go to the, uh, the appearances menu in WordPress, go to widgets. In there, you now will see, with this code, you'll see a custom sidebar widget area. Just drop that widget into that sidebar. Um, I can't on this site because I've got an HT access rule that blocks it for everybody but me at home. Because <laughs> I'm paranoid. Yeah, you just drag a widget into that new custom sidebar because now it's here with this piece of code here. This adds the sidebar. And then you just drag that widget into that sidebar and it gets output via this hook down here. It's all CSS. So if you want two different things, you could use some CSS rules to say that the width of each of your widgets is 50%, and then do a float left, and you'll have those two widgets sitting side by side in your sidebar that's going sideways instead of vertically on the side of your page. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. Answers your question? Yeah. Yes. OK. Anything else? Well, a filter for what? Genesis has a bunch of filters. They 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 have a Genesis filter for your uh, for your title, I think. Yeah, post title. I think this one's a filter, not necessarily a hook. Yeah, actually. I think in here I had the, uh, there's a hook reference also linked to on this page. Um, I didn't save a, hook, uh, a link to the filter reference, but I think it's just filter reference. OK, yeah, so there's, there's all the filters that Genesis has. And you can use this, these filters like any other filter in WordPress. You just do a add filter, the name of this filter from here, and your callback function, and then do whatever you want to with that content. So where would I put that? Is that maybe another plugin, or could I use that in a widget, or could I use 
Well, Genesis doesn't care whether you're using this code in a plugin or your function's PHP. It just wants the code to be executed before you start rendering the page. So this is just It depends on the filter. Some of these filters just filter some text, and then the framework will output that later. But because you have this, this chance to filter that content before it goes out to the page, the effect is you're, you're changing that content before it goes out to the page. If, if I make a plugin, I make a short person here, then whoever gets that shortcut, they all that content out. Yeah, yeah. But that's using a short code. Right. That that's not really a filter. That's that's another thing. Yeah, you got short codes, filters, and hooks, but they all have callbacks, and you write the callback function to do whatever you want it to do. Clear as mud. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So that's what I got. We're just cranking them out today. All right, it's Suzette. Yay! Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Let me try that again. Suzette Frank. <laughs> uh oh. Just a moment here. I throw everything on the ground. You have to remind everybody what you're showing. Okay, sure. Hello, everybody. I'm Suzette. I work at Media Temple as a WordPress evangelist. And I'm going to show you something that I came across when I was doing some research on optimizing um, WordPress to run faster on your server. <laughs> Without um, caching or compression, since um, there are certain hosts, like um, WP Engine is one of them, they have their own caching solution. So I was looking for, and as well as Media Temple, they have their own caching solution. So you can't really install cache on there because it will conflict with what's already running. <coughs> but what I did find was a really cool plugin called P3 Plugin Profiler, Performance Profiler. And what this does, <coughs> once you install and activate it, there's no really settings to configure on this, but you would start a scan, and it scans to find out um, what is actually taking up the most resource on your site. You don't have to screen that in the more or less you have to Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's just running through the scan right now. And it's going to provide a, a chart that shows like if by like a pie chart of which plugins are taking the most resource on your site. So you can either disable those or find a different solution that isn't so resource intensive. So you just click on view results. And then this is what it gives you down here. It's just really simple. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So we can see that work, WordFence security is taking up a lot of resource, and uh, that seems to be the biggest defender. Other. Other. <laughs> I know Jetpack takes up a lot of resource as well, but it's like a million plugins bunched into one. Um, so there's that's about it to it. You can you can actually see detailed breakdown. I think the, the chart that they first show you is actually the most um, useful. But it does give you um, 
an idea of what your plugins are taking a load. And then along with this, I also wanted to show if you haven't heard of Google PageSpeed or Yahoo's YSlow, that's a really good tool that you can install on your browser that will help you to baseline um, the time on your site. Um, I'll show you at this one right here. Oops. They have extensions for Chrome and Safari. This one is through developer tools. And what it does is it adds a tab at the end. But I can't seem to find. <laughs> oh, yeah, I just passed it. There it is, page speed. So it adds this tool, and you just click Analyze on here. And then what it does is it loads your page, and it tell, gives you a, a, a grade based on how fast your website is performing. So one, one good thing to try is like to deactivate all your plugins, run this, then reactivate what you normally have on there, and then run this again, and you'll see the effect. It's, it's quite a difference. Um, so what this is telling me here, let's see. They've already taken me away <laughs> many times. I just escaped. <laughs> those are the wrong type of sirens. Those are actually fire trucks, not copters. How do I know that? I don't know. Right. So what it does is it, it'll actually give you um, different um, things that you can do to speed up. You can combine your images into a CS sprite. There's different uh, just recommendations to make your, your site faster. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? Sure. So when you say make your site faster, like loading faster? Yes. Yeah, loading faster. I saw a presentation. They said that 20% is the actual back end that's loading, and 80% is the front end that's loading. So you really want to focus on things on the front end that you can minimize, like using um, a really good theme. Some themes are really resource intensive, um, so you might want to check that. You can change your... Your, uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, you could base like if you change your, your theme to the default theme, you can run a, a page speed against it, you can see it runs pretty fast, and then you change it to your theme, you'll see that there's a little bit of a lag there. Any other questions? What you showed in page speed, there's a, a ping down tool to do that as well. Yes. Kingdom Tools, it's um, tools.kingdom. I have a general question about all these tools, which is that I find that they give wildly different results and they don't always correlate to what you actually experience when you load the page. And I'm just wondering like, why that is and if people feel like one tool is more accurate than another. Well, if I run um, Yahoo's Wise Speed, I seem to like the results that Google's page speed uh, gives me a little bit better because it tends to be higher. Um, y slow is pretty harsh. It always gives me a D, like no matter what. Um, so Google speed and the combination of also the tools at Pangum, I think will just give you a pretty good idea. Like I've seen pages, I've seen results where it's like it'll give me like an A or a B, but the load time is still like a lot. So. Oh, you can. Yeah, I know. There's also you can have it test from different locations as well. I think that's what Pingdom does. It actually tests from different locations and also what browser you're using. So some of them, some of the tools have settings to change those as well. I think to answer Lucy's question, though, there is no one tool. It gives them all. Yeah. yeah. I just make a decision about amongst all, say, these three different ones go, all right, well, this one says this, and this one says this, and this one says I'm crap, but these two says I'm good. Throw that one out. It's like going to a doctor for a second opinion. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> go to a third. <laughs> There's an article on the internet somewhere by some value. You know what I find? Go to <laughs> what uh, <laughs> Slow does and why they have these tests. And why he thinks they're <laughs> I like white. I like the web page speed test stuff. That I've used that one as well. Web page yeah. speed test. It does like a waterfall. Does stuff. it a uh, security yeah. have one as well? Huh? Security. Is this this is the one web yeah, page test? Oh, this one, yeah, you can see the I like this because it does a lot of things. You can kind of see how long you're going to Yeah, it does. It will show you like this script takes like this long to load. <laughs> and. <laughs> 
The Pingdom did too. See, it has like yeah. this is showing the style sheet loading there, the pinnet, all the different things that are loading. Yeah, so they're all similar, and then they'll be different depending on different times also. So you may like try the best like four out of five or something, kind of average that out to get a better idea. Yes. That speed test tool has a couple of other features. This one? Speed test. Oh, okay. When it gives recommendations about compressing image sizes and minimizing the CSS and JavaScript, uh -huh. they'll actually give you a link you can right click and download the minimized version of the JavaScript or oh. the best version of the image. Oh, that's so cool. It, it doesn't work. This one is why slow. Why slow does that work? So is it? Why slow does that as well? I think we're going to segue into a discussion about optimization. One of the things that I look for in these reports that you're running is always look for missing elements, missing images, missing, missing CSS files, missing JavaScript. Um, if you're using plugins that are coded by people working out of their garage, sometimes there's <laughs> missing JavaScript files, and those things can really affect your your, your page. Yeah, if it's looking for something that doesn't there that's right. isn't there, that's that's really and, and causing all kinds of uh, server errors. Ooh, yeah. So it's just another tool that we have for troubleshooting, pretty much. You can see on here it has just different recommendations. Use a content delivery network. Avoid empty S SRC or href. Add expire headers. Um, use gzip. But it really depends on a combination of things. So that's just one, one thing to look at. Content. Use CSS. Also combining, if you can combine your CSS scripts and your JavaScripts into one file. I know it's a little bit hard because some plugins add their own JavaScript and they add their own style sheet and that kind of adds because that's not another request that the server has to go out there and get. Um, so that's just a different way to do it. Any, any question? No? Okay, that's all I had. <laughs> so one of the other topics that was on our um, possible uh, topics of discussion was WordPress optimization, but specifically I, I wanted to lead the discussion around what Suzette just showed. Um, so I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> my savvier clients use these tools, and when I make a website, they will actually go to these tools, run the website even when it's in the development mode, and let me know what they find. My savvier clients. You're not taping this, are you? <laughs> now all of my clients do that. <laughs> um, but actually, that's that's a good thing. Um, you know, I, I I do try my best to get the bugs out before we uh, we go live with something. So these these tools are, are pretty critical in um, in our development process here, and I, I just kind of wanted to throw this out to the group as to what uh, if you're u already using these tools, if you plan to use these tools in your normal development process. I do. Yes, was that a yes or a maybe or a? Try it. Is that a New Year's resolution or? <laughs> no, it's a, a lot of times I'm running the test and I'm starting to learn what. Some of the stuff means, mm -hmm. trying to figure out what the rest of it means and how to actually implement it. Cool. One of the uh, one of the ones that's been built into um, um, the web developer plugin for a while, and I think is still in there is in I can't remember if it's built into Firefox or not, or maybe this is part of Firebug. Is Waterfall. No. Um, What's this over? I use the latest version of, I use the latest beta release of Firefox because it's, um, uh, what's that? It's most buggy. No, it is, it is the most buggy, but it works with a um, retina display. The current version of Firefox doesn't work with retina. And I don't, not, I don't, I don't like Chrome. Um, 
what's the um, web tool? Anyway, the, this this plugin has a a check with the W3C um, the tools on it. Um, I, I, sorry, let me let me install this plugin. The I'll show you the HTML validator. Yes. Um, this one will drive you nuts. You, you're not going to make your site perfect. There's just there's 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 no way to get down to zero errors or alerts. So, the Facebook tags and say, no. Yeah, you, you kind of have to know what to what to pay attention to. Um, so I'm going to. Um, Run my own site through this plugin, and and then cry. Um, so the web developer extension has a there it is tools validate HTML. So before I run this, let me let me just talk about what this is going to do uh, for a moment. <laughs> um, so this is literally going to go through the entire page that I'm sitting on and and run it through. Um, I forget the source that it comes from, but it's going to look for every possible kind of HTML error and alert that it can find. Um, my goal is usually less than 100. Um, that, that's a good target. If you can get there, you're probably fine. Um, I haven't run this on the new Zeek site. We just launched this recently. So like I said, somebody get me a Kleenex. Um, that must have been fairly recent, wasn't it? Oh, look at that. It, it didn't find, it didn't find much. Probably stuck in the head. Woo! Nine errors. That's yay. It's a wood. It's a wood thing. Uh, anyway, um, um, W3C is what I was, is what I was trying to remember. The um, the markup validation service. Um, I, I hate to do this to my client, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and, and do this for PJ Media right now. And put Tabby right on the spot. So we'll see what PJ Media comes up. So PJ Media, actually, that's not bad. So 57 errors, 10 warnings. You said less than 100 was that's still That's still pretty low, right? Some of the sites that we've run through this in the past um, have been 500 errors. Um, and that's not uncommon to see that kind of thing on a, on a, on a website. So. Do you want to do a Genesis one? Sure. Go do mine. All right. Your local <laughs> see how So we get more in a Kleenex. <laughs> 13 errors. Look at that. <laughs> so, actually, um, some of these things, and the reason I want to show this, some of these things can be cryptic. It's 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 tough to always to always kind of track these things down, but they are important. And the ones you want to pay attention to are the ones with the with the red X's. Those are the ones that are that are somewhat serious. The warnings may or may not be serious, but usually it's it's tags that aren't closed properly. Um, um, Tags that are formatted wrong, um, things that don't have proper alt tags. You know, it's just stuff that that, that are really picky uh, when it comes to HTML. But these these tools are important and and are good to know. And if you are um, really thinking about page speed and um, the speed of your site and website optimization, these are things you should pay attention to. So the stuff that Suzette, what's that? Cross browser. Nobody nobody uses the, that other machine. <laughs> Here's what I use. <laughs> no, actually, that is that is a great point. Um, you know, if if you if you look at your Google Analytics, there's still a, a significant number of your users that are using uh, Internet Explorer. So um, they are out there. Um, <laughs> um, so these these are definitely things to pay attention to if you're if you're seriously getting into website optimization. And each of these things matter. So each of these errors might only improve your page load by a microsecond. Um, but if you're talking about a scalable website, that stuff adds up very quickly. So the stuff that uh, Suzette showed, uh, any of those tools are fine. PageFeed, YSlow, Pingdom, um, any of those tools are great. This is also something you should pay attention to. Brandon, did I miss anything else that's sort of um, that is like these tools that you use on a regular basis? Put Brandon around on the spot. Yeah, <laughs> you're with me though, right? You've 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 had you've you've been in the 500 error range before. Yeah, it's like we talked about this um, in some some of the stuff um, like it's, it's uh, they don't, the tools don't detect a lot of times what version of the machine you're running. And so they'll give you a correct error. Um, you know, so if you're 
three and only two all five, that works most of the time. It doesn't always work. And uh, you know, I mean, like you said, these are these things are sort of like like the pirate guys like they can for what they are. That's right. Yeah, don't kill yourself over like fixing don't, what you want to do. Don't lose sleep. Unless you're at 500 errors. <laughs> <laughs> if you're below 100, you're, you're probably okay. Yes, Shredder. As soon as your client gets a hold of the site, they're going to add a bunch anyway. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and of course, like, some of these things really come from the content. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's, exactly right. That, that's exactly right. So, so and actually, um, when we did run a lot of these things, when my clients ran a lot of these things, um, we actually were able to go in and use it as an education tool and say, well, Here's why you're. Here's how you're writing your content. Here's how you're embedding tags. Here's how you're tagging some of your stuff inside of the HTML. And mostly, usually, what it came from is people were copying and pasting from Word. Yeah. So, so <laughs> we're able to actually. And again, I, I know everybody cringes here, but we're able to use that as an education tool. Going to our client, say, well, this is why you have a lot of these errors. And and we were able to hunt it down and say, okay, you're copying and pasting from Word. Here's why you don't do that because then you show up with you know, all these errors on the page. Or you use the little paste from Word for text And we all know that works, you know, <laughs> remarkably well. That's why you just go over to the text side. Right. The text side. Is there an alternate to paste from Word? Use the text one. Right. Not the, not the paste from Word button, but just switch over to standard HTML. Sure. And paste there. Okay. The but then they're going to go, oh, well, I lose all my formatting. It's like well, tough. Tough. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not going to get into the details of, of this because we've covered this in other meetings, but one of the other things that um, Suzette mentioned I just want to sort of uh, uh, reinforce is the um, uh, CDN, the, sort of the power of using a CDN. So when you're using Pingdom tools and, and uh, you know, why slow or any of those things, they're really judging not only errors, but they're judging speed, how fast the content reaching uh, them. So if you are getting some of those longer timelines uh, when you're using these tools, adding a CDN into your mix will or should reduce uh, some of that. And that's really the, the goal there. Um, and that's when my clients are reviewing the site, again, I, I mentioned in the back that they're looking, you know, we're definitely looking for broken links. Those are, those are kind of the number one thing that's, you want to get rid of all of those right away. Those are the kind of number one thing that can sort of really uh, bork your site. Uh, but those longer stretches of, of timelines, those longer downloads are, 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 are things you want to address. And whether it's a CDN or maybe a lower res image or you know lower res content or something, that those are the kinds of things you want to, want to look at. So that's, that's really all I had on optimization. Anybody else have anything to add to that? And we, we cover optimization a lot here, so I didn't want to spend the whole uh, Choose meeting. Choose your host wisely. What's that? Choose your host wisely. Choose your host wisely. Well, some general notes uh, hey. share hosts. Share host. Yeah. Forget about optimizing if you're on a share host. Really? Oh, that's, that's not true. true. That's not true. You're, well, you cannot. <laughs> this side of the room says that that's not true. Let's start a yeah. debate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Address the. You cannot go to their their Apache configurator yourself and change the stock and turn on new tags. Hang on. Well, hang on. Go ahead. You can, you can still make improvements, maybe within yeah. certain parameters, There's but... Only you, everything in your directory. You cannot edit php.ini, you cannot make sure they've got this. I agree with that, but I think that's host dependent, yeah. even on a shared account. Yeah. 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 I think so we can all agree you can always make the site slower. You can always make the site slower, yes, <laughs> yes you can. <laughs> Shredder, did you want to... Uh, no, well, I was going to say... Uh, yeah, there are a ton of things you can do to make your site faster, if not scared. Um, the number one biggest thing being, you know, your CDN servers. That's actually not what I was going to say, but uh, <laughs> the number one thing being if you're not caching cache. I mean, I think, and your host isn't caching already for you, of course. You know, for instance, the VPN case that that's what I was talking about. But if you're not caching cache, even if you're caching for a really small amount of time and just dropping caches immediately, you're going to do way better if you get the card. Uh, especially on shares. I agree. Just use no solutions. <laughs> or go down. <laughs> no, no solutions is actually going down. <laughs> well, the bar is set pretty low there. <laughs> yeah. that's There's a actually uh, one thing I wanted to mention. There was like a few plugins that I noticed were like big resource hogs. 
And one of them has to do with something that you mentioned was the broken link checker. There's a plugin that does oh. this, but it's really resource intensive. It says hundreds of HTTP requests and it's insane. Mm. So if you use brokenlinkcheck.com, it will do the same thing. You run it once and then you usually don't need to run that on a continual basis. No. So you're saying don't use that? Don't use that. Use brokenlinkcheck.com. And you have to enter a catch it. Ugh. <laughs> God, I hate X6R <laughs> N4. They're getting worse. <laughs> no, you're getting older. Yeah, well, that's. But both are happening simultaneously. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stuff you can run locally on your Mac or your PC also, but this was an online solution. Um, yeah, it, it does take a while to run, but the report okay. that it gives you is pretty comprehensive. <laughs> It tells you where the link is located and what's broken. So okay. that'll help your errors as well. Cool. Is there anything, um, it's kind of for Shredder and for Suzette, is there anything that will uh, let me know if, if I'm, I was going to say under a DOS attack, not necessarily a DOS attack, but something that's, that I'm getting a flood of traffic from a particular IP address? There are a lot of ways to check. I would say the best way is probably going to depend on the host. Okay. Um, there are a few scripts that are, do you guys provide uh, public logs? I can't remember that you can go and access all of your logs. I'm not sure. I think it depends on which plan you have. It probably depends on the host a lot. Um, but I know that we have a few scripts, for instance, that we can just run that will go through all your HTTP logs and we'll grab and figure out which, uh, where you're getting it from the most. Okay. That can probably be generalized out. Um, questions about that. Yeah. Just let me know. Or Cloudflare will block a lot of bad traffic as well. So that's something good to use. Who okay. is that? Well, I only ask because it, it's happened to me a couple of times in the past. And Servant, which yeah. is the host that I use, they just they go in, they add those IPs to yeah. their block list and I'm done. Yeah. And I, um, I but I only I have to notice it. I actually start I will start seeing slow performance on my site. It's hard yeah. I mean, uh, a lot of hosts, basically, we just have to install lots and lots of DDoS prevention hardware. Mm -hmm. It's being kind of the end thing. But as far as the server level, yeah, there's some scripts that you can run to check that and figure out which IPs there really quickly. I'll grab them. OK, just a question. Anything else on optimization before we move on? All right. Almost 16 bad links on the C. So. <laughs> 16 bad links on my site? 18. 18. And are you using this, bad link checker? No, integrity. Oh, well, I have none of that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so we did uh, Jason, Suzette, Dave, Lauren, did you? Sure. Before I go, do you want to? I'm going to save mine for Sarah after here? pizza. Yeah. Sarah's here, but um, I'm going to save mine for after pizza. Can you computer? You may. You may. Oh, do you have a little bit of this? I don't know. It's a Mac. It's a Mac. I might kind of, yo. I might have to bang the keyboard really hard. I can stand here and translate for you. <laughs> Lauren Mason. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Okay, Sarah, where are you at? Hey, doing? So did the sender fault? Did the SPF record fix your problem? Yeah. Now, are you using Mailchimp or any other email service provider with that same domain? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. But you want to know about this. Okay, so who knows what spam is? It's a can. It comes in a can. Yes, exactly. It comes in a can. It tastes really good. Yes. Squirrels, possum, and mice. I like that. Okay. So it came up in the WordPress group about uh, somebody, uh, Sarah's domain. Other people were getting email that were saying it was coming from her. But it wasn't coming from her. That is because somebody is spoofing her email address. You can do it if you know how to do it. I can go and use Steve's laptop if I wanted. And I could send an email as Steve or as Jeff or as Brandon to Sarah, and it would look exactly like it came from her. Steve, how do you avoid that? You use what's called the SPF record, which stands for Sender Policy Framework. Sender Policy Framework means you are telling the internet that only one server or multiple servers can send email for your domain name. 
guys talk say? Right? Yes. Okay. If you want to read about it, just do a Google search for sender policy framework, but it's a lot of technical jargon, and I'm not going to go through it. All it really means is make sure only your server or multi multiple servers can send email for your domain name. Now, the specifically on the multiple servers is what I want to get into. Who of us use Google Apps for our email, but we might use MailChimp or Aweber for our mailing lists? <clears throat> is MailChimp and Aweber the same mail server as our Google Apps? No. So what you need to do is you actually need to modify your SPF record to have all the domains for where any of your email can come from. Where is the SPF record? Where does it look like? Where does it live? Like where does it live on your DNS server? Wherever you manage your DNS entry. So let's say you're using DreamHost and you've got your name servers for your domain name pointed at DreamHost, you go into your DreamHost control panel and add this record in or edit this record because it might be there. Or if you change your name servers to Cloudflare, you go log into your Cloudflare account. Now, I just read this one this morning, and even I didn't know about this. It was pretty nice. So if you're using Google Apps or MailChimp, it's kind of hard to see here. All right, right there is part of the SPF record. You see right here where it says include underscore spf.google.com. That is telling DNS, telling the internet that any email coming from the google.com servers is legitimate. Also, include colon servers.mcsv.net. One thing specifically is that not, not multiple records, not multiple SPF records, it's one SPF record, and all the domains are on one line. What happens if the staffers using Google Chrome? You kind of screwed. I don't know. Well, oh, okay. <laughs> well, actually, that's just this is not protecting your email from incoming spam. No, no, no. But like, if the if the spammers using Google Apps as well, and you spit it out a whole bunch of emails, or just a few to mess with somebody. Well, yeah, you're kind of screwed, and that goes back to even John's point was email is the most horrific security implementation there is. Yeah. There's, it's the it's not, this will help tremendously. It's not perfect. But still, if I wanted to, Jason's on Google Apps, and I'm on Google Apps. I could actually use a pop account and go in there and say I'm sending email as Jason at TuckerPro.us, and nobody would really know the difference unless they dive deep, deep into the headers. Any questions? So let's say you set this. And let's say the spammer is not using Google as well. What does this actually do? Does it prevent that? It doesn't completely it? prevent it, but what it helps is helps these uh, spam filters notice that goes, hey, all right, so Lauren is now sending an email as Lucy using Steve's server sitting here in the office. And when I'm sending the email as you to Brandon, when Brandon's mail server gets it, his spam filter, he's probably using Google Apps or something awesome like that. No, I don't know. I think you're using Earthlink, aren't you? <laughs> AOL. AOL, okay. Well, actually, AOL spam filter is actually pretty good. <laughs> but the spam filter will go, oh, well, I'm getting an email from Lucy that's supposed to go to Steve, but it's not coming from your mail server. That's most likely spam. Extend the spam. That's what it does. It helps the mail servers talk to each other, and the spam filters talk to each other and say, yes, this post is approved to send email from this domain name, or this IP address is approved to send email from a specific area. If it comes from another server, you have a 99% probability it's a spam or a forced email address. Any more questions? No? Oh. So what's the difference or overlap or relationship between SPF records and domain fees? No. I have no idea. All right. Never touched it. That's all. All I know about this is that we are trying to put this on Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> for, for my knowledge, I don't 
if I don't like the way we set up right, so that the stamp filters work right, and emails getting delivered and not being spam and all that, I set up SPF records and the main. Yeah, I honestly don't know. I've never actually messed with it. I've only done the SPF records. Mm -hmm. uh, one last thought. If you want to look to see if you have an SPF record, if it's there or if it's not, I love this website, mxtoolbox.com. It's possible to pose as a server. So key put another layer of station. MX Toolbox is an awesome site. You can do a ton of different DNS queries. Your default, it'll look up your MX records. Then if you type SPF, I don't even think I have one. Yeah, it's true. I'll screw me over. Oh, wait, can I say that? <laughs> Sarah, what was that domain you were working on? Say that again. Holy <laughs> Spell it. Viper is Victor. I still can't hear you. Still has one. All right, I give up. <laughs> <laughs> Steve and Zeke doesn't have one. Hey, we can have some fun with the Zeke mail servers. Please don't. Okay. <laughs> Any more questions? None? Yes? Thank you. Have a nice evening. <laughs>
He was an actor. But you know what? It was he was referencing that other guy who was. No, yeah, I don't remember. So, I'm actually, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this uh, movement because we use WordPress for the back end for all of our apps. So, um, all, of our, all of our mobile apps, especially our enterprise stuff, we're using WordPress as our server side. Um, but we're writing that, that middle tier layer for communicating between WordPress and whatever native app we're writing. Um, so, so, I think part of it is, is this. Uh, movement towards using JSON rather than XML or DC. Uh -huh. So I think you're going to see a lot more movement in that direction. Uh, so why I understand. X XML or PC is a bitch. <laughs> it's a bitch. Yeah. It's, I don't know. I've done some work on XML or PC in 3.5. I've, I've, done, I've done some work on it recently. The problem is there's no documentation. Yeah. yeah. There's no documentation, and it's not consistent. But it's gotten a lot better. It has gotten a lot better, but it's not consistent. Yeah. So, so each each call, and they come. It's because they come from different sources. Um, they're not all original WordPress calls. So that's true. The one thing I really like about the XML RPC framework is um, that's you can build your own methods to it. So, uh, like we're doing some stuff like that on Vanity. We use XML RPC documentation that. So there wasn't like an authentic authenticate method. And we were able to like there's a filter that you can create when you can make the app call to do whatever you want to. That's great if you control the back end of the WordPress site. If if you're writing the plugin for the back end of the WordPress site, that's fantastic. What we were trying to do was um, literally recreate a new WordPress front end. Um, because the WordPress app itself, what was the technical term for it? Blows. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you can write a plugin for the back end, you can tap into those things. But if you're relying on stock core WordPress XML RPC, there's, you're going to hit a wall at some point. Yeah, I mean, if you're just dealing with things like whatever, it's fine. But I do agree with you. I mean, the, the framework is there to do your own stuff. So, is there anything? Is there any? What's happening on the JSON side? I think they're just they're. I wouldn't say they're replacing XML RPC, but I think more and more we're going to see the see. ability to access data JSON. Yeah. Pizza. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, I think it'll happen. It's something that, like, obviously, it's easier for them to the strange Absolutely. Let's go left on that one. It's a couple, it's the first driveway. Pizza for Left on that third, left on the first driveway. Second building. Sorry. Yeah, so you second have an excuse though, it's your first time here. Yeah. That is correct. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Sorry, yeah. Just, just trying to get the pizza here. Maybe, so, say it again. Maybe a different driver, but you know, you can get a pizza place. It's not like it's not a phone. Like it's not a phone. So they, 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 there was a guy that gave a talk on this at OC WordCamp, right, at, in, in June. What, was he on the core team for XMR PC? Yeah. No? Just, just a dude? <laughs> All right. Uh, because XMRPC is. Uh, it was in. It was in. Yeah. He's super tall. He's tall. When I say he's tall, you know he's tall. Yeah, he's gotta be tall. <laughs> uh, So what were you saying, you, uh, David? You were saying that there's index-ajax? Yes, I'm sure that. I came across some tutorial. I don't remember exactly where I found it. We talked about it in Ajax. I'll talk about the same thing. 
on the loans are paid once and goes out again. And just free credits. Hmm. Hey, there was this animal that had an elephant camp. That 19-year-old kid. Oh, Taylor Jasko. Yeah. You did a side by side. Yeah. Yeah, that's all for the TV. Taylor Jasko. Yeah, there's an admin Ajax. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with this. Yeah, that's the script that gets run when you're on an editing or something. It's an Ajax calls to the admin. But he also hijacked that to the public side. Okay. Who here has no idea what we just talked about? All right. So essentially, what we're talking about is is a middle tier layer, is sort of a go between between WordPress as the back end and another app besides a website. So WordPress has your theme built in for a website, but if you're building a a mobile app, for instance, an iPhone app, an Android app. Yes. Cash. Um, here you go, Mark. Watch your notes. All that? Yeah, it's good. Okay. It's good for you. Um, so what we're talking about is ways to get data out of WordPress when it's not a website. And that's really... Brandon, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's really, I mean, that's what Matt was talking about. That's that's build, building WordPress as an application framework. You're going to need some sort of go-between layer to get the data, the data to somewhere else yeah. easily. That's what we're talking about, Priscilla. OK. <laughs> Pizza's here. I'm running a little low on paper plates, so um, um, everything I, what's that? Uh, no, uh, you can't. Um, not my laptop. Uh, there's paper towels out there and napkins, so we'll we'll reconvene in about 15 minutes. This is called invasion of the light. Okay. Cool. <laughs>
Uh, I, I did for a while. I had it for a while. I had uh, that was that was never brought up for a while. Let's go.
Last thing to talk about tonight is um, desktop server. Is desktop server? So um, 
Uh, a couple questions came up around desktop server, and that was sort of moving sites from production to local, moving sites from local to production, sort of talking between the two. Who brought that up on Facebook? Oh, I guess it was Robert. Yes? You did. I brought it up in November on the general dating set, the developing Okay, so we're here. <laughs> okay. Show of hands. Who's using desktop server currently in their production process? Who has no idea what desktop server is? Okay, good. Um, who's using MAMP? WAMP? XAMP? Other kind of AMP? <laughs> what other AMP is there? LAMP. Right. What? <laughs> What's that? What is it? I don't know what that is. I have no idea what that is. I'm sorry. I don't. I, I don't know. FTP. Uh, no. That does not count. Does that answer your question? <laughs> um, so essentially, what these things are, what desktop server is, and what these things I'm mentioning are, are um, local versions of my website. And the reason I like desktop server, I used. I used to use MAMP. I was a. I swore by MAMP Pro for years. Um, it took me a while to get on a desktop server, and since I've been using it, I have not looked back. Desktop server is really made for WordPress local hosting development, and that's, that's what it is for. Um, the guy who makes this uh, product can't say enough good things about him. Stephen Carroll is awesome. He's, he's a local. He's in San Diego. He's spoken here before. Um, but what's that? Uh, but what, what makes him uh, great is his support is just amazing. So if you have any question, big or small, about desktop server, he is very responsive. He will get back to you very quickly. Um, and he's very uh, interested, and you can tell he's passionate about making the best product he can make. He's, he's one of those guys. So again, I, can, I, I always plug this product. I think I plug it every single meetup. I will continue to do so. I use this regularly, and this has saved me a ton of time. It's worth the 50 bucks. <laughs> And then some. I, I paid much more for this product. And I've actually bought several licenses for the people here at Zeek. So, anyway. So. The first one is going to be five minutes for the website live and not a little hours. Yep. Absolutely. So, essentially, what it does, what Desktop Server does, is if I go in and create a new website, um, I will call it um, steve.dev. Make sure I don't have a site called that. I don't. Um, I click create, and this runs through a set of scripts where it's uh, copying over a, um, a fresh installed WordPress. It's creating a database. It's creating the WP config file for me. It's creating HG access. It's, it's doing all the stuff that I has to have, that I used to have to do by hand in uh, Man Pro, um, and it, uh, it's it's it's. It's scripted to do all that stuff for me, so I don't have to think about that stuff anymore. Just it just does it. Yes. Did you have a, to set it up as far as the he said that you should go see and where you have server is? Nope. Nope. You install desktop server and it, and it installs everything for you. Yes. Which I feel guilty, but you can do blueprints. You absolutely can. Amazing. Yep. Actually, actually, let's, when this is done, I'll, I'll talk about that now uh, before I talk about sort of moving everything. So, uh, no, I do not have to set up usernames, and passwords. It just chooses one for me. So, if you already have a, a, a SQL database on there, or you install a fresh one somewhere, you can pass it. This right now, this is assuming I'm starting a site from scratch. I've not, I've not had a site in the past. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just. Doing a fresh install of a brand new website that I've never worked on before, and I'm I'm showing it this way to to, to is a it, it will get there. <laughs> it's it's coming. Okay, so it's done. Sometimes it goes quick. Sometimes it's a little bit slower. Um, I must be running some other things that are slowing down. But it took it took a minute, and now my website is is all set up. So it says it's done, um, and then it gives me a link to that local install. So now I'm ready to set up WordPress. So it's it's already created the WP config file, the HT access file. Uh, it's got the link to the database, and now I go through the WordPress install process. Um, if I look at my websites folder, I now have a, a new folder called Steve.dev, which is what I call my, uh, my my local site, and I've got all my WordPress files in there. Okay, it's done everything for me. Great.
brand new site, ready to go. Um, we'll give this site a title. <laughs> I'm ready to go. Got my fresh, clean WordPress install done, um, all set. Um, Greg mentioned you can also set up uh, different blueprints. Okay, so. Um, um, I skip by it really quickly, but when I go to create a new site, um, I give it a site name, or I can choose a blueprint. So I have a separate blueprint for WordPress 3.4.2 uh, if I don't want the latest version of WordPress. Um, um, I think Desktop Server comes with 3.4.2. I created the blueprint for 3.5 when it came out. Um, blueprints sit inside of your XAMPP folder. So Desktop Server is a GUI tool for XAMPP. So when you install Desktop Server, it's going to install the latest copy of XAMPP, and there's my Blueprints folder inside of my XAMPP folder. So blank, WordPress 3.4.2, WordPress 3.5. And it's just, all this is just a, a, a fresh, blank copy of WordPress. You should put your plugins in there that you want to Absolutely. Uh, so, not only that, but your, your WP, your config file, your config dash sample, you can go in and change the, the prefix if you want to. Add uh, other things like you want to set your revisions to be five, and all the things that you want to do to your config file, you do the config sample, and it uses that. I did not know that. Very cool. So, what's that? Yeah, it turns everything into a Very nice. So, what Lucy was saying is if I have a set of plugins that I normally use instead of WordPress, I could create a separate blueprint and call it, you know, um, Steve's default and put all my plugins in there. And as Greg was saying and, I, and Dave was saying, I could also create some specifics in my WP config file. And that could be a blueprint that I know, okay, this is this is what I normally use. Now I'm going to create that from, from, uh, from, from that starting point with that set of plugins in. Is that correct? Cool. So that's what Blueprints does uh, for you. Yes? I mean, we have the Blueprints thing, but I've done for creating the admin accounts and everything, just going in and manually editing and making the thing. And you can do that. So um, so inside of my steve.dev, I have a WP config file. I can go in and edit this just like I would any, any WordPress site. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yep. Cool. So that's. That's desktop server if you're creating a new development site from scratch. So the problem is, what if I'm working on an existing site? <laughs> OK? Um, I'm going to give you my process. It's not perfect. It is what it is. This is how I do it. Um, other people are probably going to have similar or, or um, processes that are like this. And as I mentioned on the Facebook group, uh, it's, not, it's not pretty, but it works. Okay, so there's no there's no real hook between desktop server, Git, um, FTP. Um, this is really for managing your local stuff. That's that's what this this does well. So here's what I do, and this is this is my normal process now for uh, working in desktop server. Um, if I've um, I'm going to backtrack a minute. If I'm creating a brand new site, it's a brand new project for me. Um, this is my first iteration, um, and now I, I've, I've created my desktop server uh, space on my local machine, and I want to push this up. That's a little bit easier than pulling down. So I'm going to go that. I'm going to talk about that first. So here's part of my process, and I am going to get a little bit technical here because this is my process. Um, so now that I've created my site inside a desktop server, then my next step is to turn this into a Git repository. Okay, and that's how I move files between my local machine and um, my remote machines. I do everything through a code repository. Um, who has no idea what that means? OK. Are you being serious? Are you? Yeah. OK. All right, all right. No, that's OK. That's why, that's why I asked. So um, code repository essentially gives you the ability to save iterations of your site and gives you the ability to do multiple undos if you make a mistake. 
Okay? Um, the reason I don't use FTP um, is because with FTP, if I'm dragging files up onto a site, I'm overriding, and I don't have a way to revert that back. Okay? That, is, that is the issue with FTP. FTP, for most people, actually could be fine. Um, but again, if you make a mistake, you're hosed. Unless you've got a backup copy of the file. Yep. Right? Okay. You copy the file before you overwrite it. But then I've got multiple copies of files and stuff sort of strewn everywhere. I've, I've been there. What's that? That's correct. That's correct. So what a Git repo, or excuse me, what a code repository does, and there's a few different systems, but what a code repository does is it allows me to uh, first save a version and then push it up to the server. And if that, if there's a bug with that version once it gets to the server, I have the ability on the server to roll it back to the last version. It essentially gives me the multiple undos. Okay. It also lets me um, collaborate with my team, so we can have multiple people um, pushing code up to a central repository, and it tracks all of those those differences. Okay, so if I'm working on something with Brandon, and, and we've done this before, so if, I, if I'm, we're both working on a project and we're collaborating, he's at his office, I'm at mine, I can push my set of changes up to the server, he will then pull my latest set of changes, and then push his set of changes. And the code repository does one extra thing in that step is, It'll let Brandon know at that point if there's a conflict. So maybe we both work on the same little piece of code. It'll ask him, do you want yours or, or, or Steve's? <laughs> okay. And then he gets to make that decision whether his code is better than mine, right? Usually it's his. Um, and then he'll overwrite mine and he'll push that to the server. And again, if he's wrong, which he usually is, um, <laughs> okay. Then we can roll that little piece of code back within the code repository, and all those changes get tracked. Okay, that's what a code repository does for you. Okay, WordPress, uh, the core WordPress core is on SVN, uh, which is a perfectly fine code repository. I prefer Git, um, and that's what most people. I'm just going to be bold to say that most people in the room use Git. Okay. There's Git, there's SVN, there's an older system called, well, I don't even know if it's around here, what's called Mercurial. Um, um, there's a few others. There was a, what's the Microsoft one? <laughs> right. Anyway, SVN or, or Git is probably the two most common that you're going to run across when you're talking about a code repository. So the site that I use to manage all my projects is called Assembla. Um, that's got project management, ticketing system, and code repositories all rolled into one site. So all of my code that I write gets pushed up to uh, our assembly sites. So we'll make an assembly space for every project that we have. A S S E M B L A. Very similar to Basecamp, um, you know, but Basecamp doesn't have code repo built in. If you're using Basecamp, you need another code repo like GitHub or Bitbucket or Beanstalk. I've thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a, it, you know, it, 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 it just comes down to time. Maybe we found something that works, and you know, we, we pay for it. What's the initial application you drop your command line to do that? What's that? For yourself, when you go to initialize your new. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you two. I'm going to show you both methods. So um, what I said about uh, Robert, what I said about code repos, that all makes sense. Yep. Now, okay. Anybody have any questions on that? Okay. We've si we've actually had sessions here at OC WordPress uh, where we just talked about um, code repositories. So we can do that. And we can cover that again this year if, if you want. I know it can be. <coughs> so I'm on a Mac. The tool that I use um, is Tower. Um, that's a, it's a GUI tool for um, managing my Git repositories. Uh, if you're using SVN, um, there's another tool that I like called Versions. Um, I think SVN or Versions does both SVN and Git now. Yeah. Does Tower do SVN? Yeah. Use Git SVN. Okay, so this Tower can do both as well. I've used um, I've used Versions, I've used Tower, and I've used um, Smart Git. Um, this is the one I like the best on the Mac. This does not exist on the PC. 
on the PC, you're going to use um, um, SmartKit or uh, Tortoise or something like that. So, what I do here, this, this is the GUI way of, of initializing a new uh, repository, is I will go in and create a local repository. I'll choose the path, which is steve.dev. Okay, I'll give it a title, and I'll click OK. Um, I now have a, a new uh, Git repository created. Um, nothing's checked in yet. It's just got a, a, a basically it's created a little Git area database. That's what, that's what it's done. Okay. Um, the first step in Git is to um, commit everything. Um, so this is when we talk about the saving. The saving part of Git is called a commit. Okay. And I can commit, and I typically will commit several times before I actually push code up to my server. So I like to commit up until I know it's, it's somewhat stable uh, before I will push up to the code repo. Okay. So commit um, is your save. And every time you commit, you want to give it a, a little tag so that you know what you did during that commit. This is my initial check-in. And now all of those, those new files are committed locally. Okay, nothing's been pushed yet. So if you pulled up underground.dev and see those changes? No, it says, this actually has nothing to do with my website at all. This okay. is just saving the files. Yep. Just again, two questions pertaining to you more personally than anybody. Do you upload the entire WordPress as you just showed, or do you just. Absolutely. WordPress, the WordPress core is part of my Git repository. What's that? Do you exclude the I do. I didn't, I didn't do it here, but yes. Typically, I would exclude wp-config because your settings are going to be different on the remote server, and I'd exclude HT access. What's that? Not at all. Actually, let's, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to undo what I just did. Bless you. Okay, so my I've just rolled it back, so it's, it's as if I didn't didn't do anything yet. So let's talk about a, a get ignore, and that was a great question that uh, you both asked. Me. So uh, I'm going to go back, and we're going to start a new get repo again. Uh, Steve.dev. Um, so before I commit, um, one of the one of the things you can do here is say I want to ignore certain files, um, and wp config is definitely one of them. You, you don't want this as part of your code repo because, again, your settings are going to be different on the remote server uh, than they are on the uh, on your local server. So I will just tell it in Tower here to ignore that file. Okay. So it's you're basically telling that your 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 local repo that that file is not to be included. Okay. Now if I look back in my file structure here, I have uh, a get ignore file. And it's just going to have one line in it saying ignore WP config. I don't have an HT access file yet, so there's nothing to ignore. But if I, if I wanted to, and this is what I usually do, I'll just go in manually. I can add that. Um, just the file name because it's sitting in root. So it's at the same level that the git repo is sitting at. Okay, so HD access is always going to be at that same level. Okay. Well, I guess I can say files What's that? It depends on where the file is located. Okay, so if it's just sitting in the root, you can put the file name. If it's in a folder, then you need to put that path. Yeah. Um, or you could give it a sort of a, um, a star string if you want to exclude Ignore a whole bunch of files that are like it. Yeah, and I typically again, I'm 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 doing this very quickly, but my get ignore usually uh, includes um, w, uh, uploads, so wp content slash uploads, because 
all that content, I don't need to put it into the Git repo. Okay. So um, Tower, and this is kind of important. Now that we've I've, I've made an edit to that Git ignore file, it recognizes that there's a change to it. Okay. I, I haven't committed anything yet, but you'll start to see as you make changes, the Tower um, or, or whatever GUI editor you're, you're using will recognize those changes. Let me show you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commit all these changes. We'll do another initial check-in. Did I miss? Oh, thanks. Modify. Thank you. So if I go in now and make a little change, um, sort of debugging on. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry. WP config is even hard. Let's make a change to the WordPress license. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> You'll see that Tower right away recognizes that there's a there's been a change in this file. And here's the cool part: is inside of Tower you have a lot of uh, nice management tools. So if I say, you know what, I, I don't really want that change, um, I can actually discard all the local the, that local change or discard it line by line, um, and then it'll resave my license file to the last version. So that's 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 sort of the power of this tool: is all those code changes. Are saved and you can you can remove them at any time, so you can roll back very easily. Okay, so I've uh, I've I've created my Git repository. I've checked in my uh, my initial check in, uh, and again I'm I'm showing you my process. So if I go to assembly, I'm just going to go to an, an existing space that I already have. And again, this is a similar process if you're using uh, Bitbucket or Beanstalk or, uh, or any of those other systems. I'm just going to add another Git repo here. So what I like in Assemble, and most of the systems will do this, is it actually gives me the command line stuff, uh, if I happen to be on a server, for tying this Git repo up to the remote server. So the last part of the process, or one of the last parts of the process is not only do I have to check it in, but now I have to push the code up to my server, to, to my remote server. Okay? So what this is doing is, is this is the command to actually tie this repo to that Git install, to that, to that, to, to that I'm sorry, to this server to that Git repo. Does that make sense? What I can do here is, inside the tower, I can just copy this URL. I'm going to add a remote repository here, and I'm going to paste that in. So that's now tied my local repository to that remote repository. So those two things now talk to each other. Okay. Still has nothing to do with my production website. Okay. All I've done on Assembla, Assembla is just a storage space for my my remote Git repository. Okay, it's not going to my web server yet. Okay, it's a it's a go between. So my my code repo, my remote code repo sits here. My local machine is here. Eventually, my production server is going to be here. So I'm going to be pushing code up to my remote machine and then pulling it. I'm sorry, pushing code from my local server up to my code repo, my assemble space, and then pulling it down to my production server. That's the process of how I move code in between. Okay. Same way. If I make a change over here, I'll push it back up and then pull it back down. Okay. FTP, you're just going here to here and you're overriding. This in between gives me that ability to undo uh, code. Okay. That's not exactly accurate, but it's a good way to think about it. Okay. The more accurate version is every code, uh, every Git repo that's on each of the machines actually contains all of that those changes. It's the syncing between them that 
brings them up to date, and then you can roll it back very easily. But locally, all, all the code that you've ever made is stored within those Git uh, repositories. Okay, so I've 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 linked the two. Now all I have to do is take my my local code, and I'm just going to drag it to Origin. Okay, and that publishes it. Making sense so far? This is local to assembler. Okay. Keep in mind the confusing part and, and where a lot of people get stuck is assemble is not my host. It's not my web host. It's not just because I'm pushing things to assemble doesn't mean it's going to be available to the public or my client or anybody. That's not what's happening. Just storing my files, my PHP code. It's, to, it's slow here, so it's taking a second. Um, but we will come back around the desktop server in a minute. I just want to explain this, this part of the process first. Part of the reason you want to include that or, or ignore those uploads file is the larger your repo, the longer it takes to move stuff back and forth. So I tend to exclude that whole uploads folder because there's just no reason to have it um, in my repo. Usually. Some clients, what I have them do is we actually do include the uploads folder inside of the repo. And on a nightly basis, we have to set up on a cron job to do a, a git, commit, and push. It just happens automatically. And that's how we're backing up their images folder. So if they lose anything on the server, we have a full backup on assembly. You can do that with database as well. Um, so we'll, we actually, when we're storing a database, we'll have a separate git repo just for database. And I'll do something similar to what we're doing with images. We'll actually do we write a cron job that does a database dump to a SQL file, pushes it up to pushes it to the local Git repository, um, sorry, commits it to the local Git repository, and then pushes it up to assembly. And that's how we do our database backups. So I've pushed everything. Now if I look back at assembly, we'll reload this space. There's all my files. Okay, so everything's everything's categorized. That's my latest change set. Sorry, sorry my latest commit. Remember I said initial check-in, so everything's tracked there on assembly. So this is just viewing the get repo that's sitting at assembly now. Okay? So how I get that on my production server. Okay. I apologize for ahead of time. I'm gonna go into command line here. Um, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you how this works. Um, you, are there GUI tools for managing a remote server? Can you do that in tower? I've never tried it. Can I use for remotes? What's that? We can create more for remotes. That's what we do. Right, but can in Tower, can you do your commits and everything on your remote server? I didn't think so. Okay, so. What's that? Can you make like a shell script? You could. Tower execute that? You could, but uh, for the purposes of this Tower meeting, I'm going, going to uh, I'm going to do the I'm going to do the command line stuff. Um, let me see if I have a space for this. So I'm going to go into the Zeek site. Okay, so on the Zeek site, I'm just going to create a, a subdirectory called Steve. I'm remote. Now I'm remote. I'm actually this is I'm on the server that's hosting Zeek.com. Okay. So when you're checking out uh, Git, it's called a clone. Um, I, I, I went here specifically because most repos will actually give you the command line that you need to, to, to get. Most of the better repositories that are out there um, uh, will give you the command line you need to, to, to check out the code. So I've just copied this piece of code, which is git clone, um, and then it gives me the URL. Okay. I'm going to go back over to my server. Type in uh, git clone. I don't know if everybody can see this. What's that? I will. I will be in a second. I'm going to clone it to um, 
Steve. Okay, so I'm I'm cloning it to a folder called Steve. But thank you for reminding me. I do appreciate that. Um, because I do make those mistakes all the time, especially when I'm cowboy coding. Um, so what I'm doing here in this in this line is I'm I'm checking out a copy of that repository that we just checked in. Okay. Let's hope this works. <laughs> Um, I've already, I've already uh, on this server. I've already um, exchanged oh, okay. the the um, SSH keys, so I've already made that handshake. Um, but that is an initial step you might have to do. Okay, so it's done. It's checked out. A copy of Steve. Okay, if I go into the Steve folder, there's my site. So I've just made a, I've just pulled down a copy of that that Git repo. So now again, if I make a change here, I'll push the change here up to Assembla and I'll pull it down locally so that everything's in sync. So I'm, I'm always in sync using uh, my code repository. That doesn't answer our initial question of how do I pull a site down into desktop server? Does this make sense so far? If it doesn't, it's okay. That's why I, that's why I wanted to spend some, some time on this. What do we do the database? Uh, the database, I, I will either use command line or I'll go into PHP my admin and I'll, I'll make a dump locally and then import it remotely. Or just set up, since it's, it's an initial website, I'll set it up remotely. For an existing site, I'll dump it out of a, a PHP my admin and bring it in locally. So let's talk about that. All right. Um, so, do I have an existing site that we can work with? All right, so um, if you're not already familiar with PHP by admin, get yourself familiar with it. You're going to be using it quite a bit uh, if you're doing this kind of stuff. But the, it was a good segue. So the question was, what do we do about the database? Okay. Um, so there's two parts to moving a site. There's the files, and then there's the database. Okay. So let's look and see what um, desktop server has done. Um, with desktop server, if I go into localhost at any time, I'm going to pull up the XAMPP. Uh, admin page, um, and I can go into PHP my admin locally. So I created a f uh, when I created site Steve, it adds some random uh, characters on the end of it. Um, there is my Steve database uh, locally. Okay. So what I will do um, when I'm pulling down a website is typically my first step is I will I'll pull in the database. Okay. Two ways to go about this. Um, so let's pull in. Uh, go ahead and read, uh, create the website because it's exciting. It's too big. Um, let's do this one. So this is just a test site we've got that we're working on. Um, uh, that, that one of my programmers, Justin, is working on. So I'll go into. I'm I'm remote. I'm on the uh, I'm on the Zeek server. I'm gonna go ahead and click export here. Uh, I'm just dumping out the raw SQL file. Okay. You don't want to do a WordPress export inside of the um, the administration panel because you're not gonna get all of the data. You're just gonna get the posts, uh, comments, categories, users, things like that. I really want, I want an exact replica of the website. So I, I work with the raw SQL file. So I should have this now. Yep. So I've, I've just dumped out the SQL file for Zeke underscore Justin. I'm going to go into my local database. Um, two ways to go about this. If I want to keep the original database that, um, that uh, XAMPP set up for me, excuse me, the desktop server set up for me, I can, I can keep it and create a new database, or, and this is the way I do it, I just check all the tables and we'll drop them, okay, locally. 
So I'm going to dump all the data that's in there now, and I'm going to import the file that I just uh, brought down. See, Justin? There we go. So it's brought in that SQL file. One, one thing you're going to have to change here, and this, again, I, I, I do this all the time, uh, just become a habit. Um, the URL values that are inside of the database that you pull down are wrong uh, because they're tied to my Zeek server. So you can see here they're tied to a subdomain, justin.zeek.com. You actually, now that I'm local, I have to change these to my local URL, which is steve.dev. Yes? Okay. Didn't know that. So what do I do? In the config file, you define wp underscore home and wp underscore site URL. You are going to save me a ton of time, my friend. wp underscore what? Say it again. wp underscore home. Like this? Yep. wp underscore home. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Okay. And then set it to the URL where it's local. Whatever that is. I usually set this up in my local config file. Awesome. And then, and then WP underscore yeah, site. Like that, right? Yeah. You are a god. If that's ever defined in your config file, it'll override the one you did. Awesome. So, Brandon has just saved me a ton of time in uh, my day every day. So what I was going to do is change these in the database, but Brandon's saying that if I put these in my WP config file, it overrides whatever whatever is in the database, so I don't have to do that anymore. Yes? And it doesn't override anything that has to do with content or options that's or other right. options, just to make sure that's, yeah. that's clear. Yeah, that's right. So is it, are my permalinks going to still work? Uh, yes. Your permalink yes. will work, your, but anything that is inside content that is hard coded to the other URL. That's what well, even my way wouldn't work. Wouldn't do that. Right. Hey, yeah. Steve, when you're going to import the or create a, create the site, or rather import the site into a uh, desktop server, if you make a database.sql file, like create your file database.sql, mm -hmm. during the process of creating the site, it will take that database.sql file. Import it to the database for you. Because that's all I want to say. Say that again? Try this. If you rename the SQL file database.sql, and then when you go to import it, it will it'll take that SQL file and import it to the database.sql file and import it into the database. Like, during the process of creating it. When you're creating the site. Huh. Wow. OK. And so I just remember it. Stephen was showing me what there is a little tutorial he did, and I was like, ah, I remember that. So what Shredder was saying is if you have URLs embedded in your content, this ni neither of these things are going to are gonna affect that. So one thing you can do is if, you, if, you, if and I don't recommend this with large SQL files, but if I wanted to open this in Coda, I could just do a big find and replace for those URLs. That would be a good idea. It's not, it's not a good idea. So there's but, a tool that will do that for you. Oh, really? It's serialized or really safe, too. So it will do everything in your content, everything in the options table, like everything in every Do you know the name of the tool? Oh, that it's serialized. Is that the plugin? There's a plugin. It's a mesh up here. It's a single page. Database. Database. Just look for WordPress, like search and replace database. It's a plugin. Yeah, it's one of those things. Cool. MyGreatDB. WP MyGreatDB is one. It does both. It's a single script. You put in it, we'll even pull in your, your credentials from so the config file. Where this becomes important is if you're working with multi site. Yes. Multi site does not behave like what I'm talking I, what about. I showed you with the defines will not work. And neither will my process yeah. either. So multi site becomes more difficult. So you want to find a tool like this to find and replace all the URLs. I wanted to clarify what I was saying earlier about the, the SQL file. OK. Um, what you want to do is well, once, you're, once you're ready to import that into the desktop server, it's it's kind of counterintuitive. But what you end up having to do is, is putting that, that database.sql file in, in the same directory that WP 
and dig his in. Mm -hmm. So just in the root of that site, site root. And then zip up that folder as, you know, just name it whatever you like. And then when you tell it to import it, it'll ask you, what do you how do you want to import it? And you import that zip file. So inside, inside, the server, right. inside the desktop server. Right, okay. inside the desktop server. But what else is, what else is? Yeah, when he when he imports the site, it, it actually does the scrubbing for you. So all the stuff that you're gonna come up with the serialization and stuff, okay. it does some of that for you. I don't know how deep it goes into doing it, but I know he does a lot of scrubbing. I asked I asked Steven. He said he uses basically the same script. The same thing? Yeah. So cool. it does the same thing. Okay. I could that 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 SQL that you 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 compress the entire directory. You compress the entire directory that has all the WordPress files and the SQL. Right, right. I, so, I thought you said you just compress that no. inside. Yeah, the whole, so, the whole thing. So, it works for you, Yeah. So now, now that we've got the database, okay, again, this is, this is the way I do it. I'm not saying it's right. Here's what I do, okay? Um, I will go into desktop server. I'll create a new site so that I've got that database link. And then what I do is I go into Git and I check out a copy of the site right next to it. Okay? So, what did we call this? Let's go ahead and delete this as if it never happened. <laughs> Always. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here's what I do. We've, we've talked. We've now we've we've talked about pushing how I push a site from local to remote. But let's let's not go the other way. Okay. So Jason's got one way to sort of package it all up and get it ready for desktop server. Okay. Correct. Mm -hmm. The way I do it is a little bit messier. Um, I will, um, I'll go in, I will create just a, a, an empty site. I didn't remove it. So while it's creating that empty site, I will then go in and check out a copy of the site that's on Assembla. So assuming I've already pushed something from my production server into Assembla, I'll check it out. So we'll clone it. And I will clone it right to my uh, websites folder. What did I do wrong? Oops. Create new folder, and I'll just call it Steve. So, desktop server is creating this one called Steve.dev. I'm cloning this one called Steve. It's going to take a second. Some service done. <clears throat> so de desktop server maintains its own little internal database, so it knows what sites it's created out in my uh, directory. But there's no there's no hard link to that. Desktop desktop server will, can maintain those files. But once it's created it, it's then recorded it in its internal database. So what I do is I just take my cloned folder and rename it steve.dev. Okay, so I use desktop server to sort of create all the database stuff, and then I just rename, and then copy in my wp-config file. Okay? Anyway, if Steve Carroll's watching, this may not be right, <laughs> <laughs> but it's the best hack I came up with, because there, I couldn't find a real direct way to do this. 
Um, so there's my steve.dev folder that it, uh, it created. I'm going to go ahead and, and steal the wp-config file, throw it into the one that I checked out. I'm going to delete steve.dev, and I'm going to rename the one that I checked out steve.dev. And it works. So the database is already hooked up. Um, desktop server thinks that that's, that's the folder because it's not really maintaining any hard links, and it's, it's all set to go. So that's how I move sort of remote to local. And then I'm, from there, I'm just using Git to push back and forth. So I'm all set up. That make sense? There you go, Jason. That's my process. <laughs> as messy as it is, it works for me. I'm always curious. <laughs> yep. Questions? Thoughts? Anyone tell me I'm out of my mind? I try a similar process, but I lose stuff like widgets that are defined on the left side. Some widgets are showing up on the development side of that kind of work. If you've made a direct copy of your database and your code is all the same, I don't see how that's possible. I can search and replace some. That's why. Yeah, <laughs> I, I concur. It's a, I think WP config magic. It's a, so if, if a login page. Great. Escape. If a login page is hit, then, then I, there's the locate, the relocate side of the district. So I do that, then I. Uh, the search and replace the database. Yeah, the uh, search and replace is a serialized array save. And it's probably pulling out a widget or uh, to do that. Specifically for HTTP colon It doesn't search. matter because if you change the number of characters in a serialized array and you don't update the amount of characters in that string, then it will break the entire serialized array. That's why that tool that I was showing the interconnect IT. That one will completely deal with all the serialized arrays. It basically pulls everything out, unserializes it, updates it, and reserializes it. That will solve that problem. It's cost money. It's free. Single, a single file. It will cost you. You have to buy Brandon a beer. Yeah. That's what it costs. It's also in the Codex. Yeah. Okay. So today I attempted to move a Drupal site. It wasn't that easy. It wasn't this easy. Um, um, and specifically what broke is um, Drupal deals with permalinks and HTA access much differently than WordPress. So I wasn't able to access. It took me a while to figure out the query strings to access the admin area of Drupal. And turn off their whatever their pretty permalink system is. They call it clean URLs, I think. It took me a while to actually get there to turn it off so that I can actually see the Drupal site working. And I haven't figured out how to turn it back on yet. <laughs> I'm going to just not care. What's that? Drush. I have no idea what you're talking it's about. It's the command line tool for managing Drupal. And it's supposed to be has some uh, synchronized areas. If I cared, I would uh, <laughs> I would look for it. So you're trying to do the least amount of work as possible. What's that? You're trying to do like the least amount of work as possible. Absolutely. Like Absolutely. <laughs> so look, we're converting it over to WordPress soon anyway. So if the permalinks are not pretty for a week, then they're not pretty for a week. Google will suffer for a week. That's all I got. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so it's, uh, it's 8.30. Um, we will network for about 20 minutes. Those of you who don't know, we drink both during and after the meeting. So we're going to reconvene at the House of Brews in the Huntington Harbor. And if you need directions, let me know. Uh, otherwise, we'll see you over there. Um, actually, Eric has a quick announcement. Asking a question, concern. Um, for anybody in the room, uh, I nothing else I have no limitations. If there's anybody that, can, that wants to do some piece work, for me on the WordPress uh, site, so we have to go into the CSS or um, maybe some theme changes, things I don't really want to deal with at the time. You see me, get my card. Uh, it's not steady work, but you know, every once in a while it pops up three or four hours of this, five, six hours of that. 
Um, and I really appreciate it. So you, you could probably do it too. I would take me like 150. <laughs> Any other similar name? <laughs>